being here this morning for what's going to be an incredible, inspiring, special session um, with two amazing keynote speakers. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, tell you about our first keynote speaker this morning. Her name is Honorable Tia Galgalo Ali. I first met Honorable Ali about a year ago and I was at my, my camp in Samburu and um, in the area we were having a huge stakeholders meeting. And this meeting was really boring. There was nothing coming out of it. it. There was no one making any decisions. And we were discussing really critical issues. Well, then something changed. She walked in. And she walked in and she took over this meeting. And she, with her amazing, assertive, bold, visionary, and unapologetic personality, said, this is how it's going to be done. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce her to you today. She came from a very humble background in Isiolo County. She then was the first student to finish high school in Isiolo County. She then went, and went ahead and got a bachelor's in education, a master's in education and planning, which is very rare for someone from this region. She then became the principal of a secondary school in Isiolo County for 16 years and she learned so much about the challenges and struggles that women were facing in through her experience in the school and that helped her set up the foundation for pastoralist women. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you today Honorable Tia Galgalo Ali. Thank you. Thank you, Pride the Lion Conservation Alliance, in a partnership with the Colorado State University, for inviting me to the Path African 2020, 2020 conference. Um, I think Shivani have already said quite a lot, and I thought maybe that was enough. <laughs> Is that enough? Would I need more? <laughs> anyway, thank you. Um, as uh, Shivani said, we met some time back. I was working in Isiolo County as a CEC for tourism and wildlife in Isiolo for shortly for about two and a half years. Uh, but uh, my background, I think I, I need to talk about my background a bit. Um, I'm a pastorist woman from humble background, as she said, born and raised in Isiolo. I'm an educationist, a mentor, a development worker, a legislator, having worked for local, national, and international uh, organization. I have, I'm also a community activist. Just to give you a short, brief uh, experience about my educational journey, um, I was born in 1966. I'm 53 years old. <laughs> <laughs> I know you did not ask for it, but I just wanted to show you that I came, I was one of the old ones who started school in my county. I was the first local girl who went to high school, that was uh, A level that time. I don't know if any one of you here was in the advanced level those days. If I look around here, especially for the ones from Kenya, maybe there are very few. During that particular time, back in 1980s, it was quite difficult to see a girl go to school. So as the first girl from Isolo County to even go to high school, even go to A level, that was the, 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 the advanced level, was quite difficult. My parents had not gone to school before. I mean, they never gone to school. They worked as social workers in, 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 in Islamic Foundation in Isiolo. So getting even school fees to take us to school was quite difficult. But I said, I'm not going to stop there. I might, I'm, a, I'm from a family that has 11 children, and I was the only one who went to school. And, and got to university level and up to master's level. So that required a lot of determination, a lot of, you know, taking care of a lot of challenges that they were there for girls, especially even going to school was quite difficult because people look at you and they tell your mom, they told my mom, why are you taking this girl to school because you are spoiling her? 
she's going to learn Western culture, she's going to interact with boys, so she's coming back and she'll never get married again. But I assured my mom one thing and I want to encourage the ladies here to encourage the other ladies out there. That I'll never do one th wrong thing that is against our culture. I'll do everything but I'll go to school, learn and come back a better person. So at least I had won the, 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 the interest, I mean the, the, the confidence of my mom but not my dad. Because he said, your girl should go to school, she should, stay, she should stay at home so that you can be pure, nice, pass with girl who will be married off at age 15. So I said, I'll not betray my mom. So I, 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 I won her confidence and that was one of the things. So you must win confidence of everyone, nobody around you, for you to be able to move forward. Uh, after I got to LM, of course it was quite difficult. Fees was not there, I was sent home quite a number of times. But fortunately, I also worked at school. There was one of the teachers who was a missionary teacher in that particular school, which was a high, I mean, a, um, high school and a national school that time, Agarbatula High School, which was in Isiolo also. And it was one of the few, like Starehe, Alliance, and talk of the national schools that we think of. So when I went there, then that missionary person called David, I can't forget his name, allowed me to work in, in his house, so that I'll be able to get some school, he'll pay the school fees for me so that I'll be able to continue working, I mean, continue with school. So for four years, I used to do half day school, and then in the afternoon I used to go to the, his house, take care of the, the, their baby. The wife, Joyce, was there, so I used to clean, wash dishes, clothes, and then go back to class. That really assisted me, and I say that's resilience for a pastoral girl. You have to be resilient. You have to be very hard in terms of getting to a situation where at least you take advantage of. At that early stage, I was able to be, to accept that I'm not able to pay school fees, my parents are not able to pay school fees, and I'll be able now to work and do that. And that paid off. When the exam came, I was one of the best among the boys. It's quite difficult. I was in a boys' school at Galbatua High School. It was not easy. Of course, they know how boys bull. And I hope the media know how they used to bull the women down there. So, so it was not easy. They keep on saying, oh, you know, you're not the best. You're not this. But again, I read. I decided to put all my energy because I'm good at doing, I mean, doing best in what I know. So doing best in everything that you do, I think is another thing that really helps. So I decided that I have four years to prove the rest of, to, the, to, the, to my classmates, to the boys out there, to the community, that I can do best in everything that I do. And I did not waste a single time, I mean, minute. I read like there was no tomorrow. So I used to be called book warmer. I, I, I buried myself into books. And even my, my, my ladies, I mean, the ladies who I used to be in class with, they used to tell me you don't have any other life except reading. But anyway, that is what helped me at the end of the day. Commitment. You, have, you must be committed in everything that you do because that's what I did. If I was in school, I was committed to school. When I was at home, I was committed to what is supposed to be happening at home. I used to go fetch firewood, water, and everything else. So <coughs> commitment and being focused in exactly what you do, that also helped me to, to learn. Again, I was given an opportunity to be in school by a person I did not know. This is a missionary um, person who was in that school as a volunteer teacher, and he gave me an opportunity, and I, I ran with the opportunity. So that issue of running with the opportunities available to you is very critical. Quite a number of people are given opportunities, but they don't take advantage of it. So for me, the opportunity that came to in my hands was the best thing that I would use as a platform to propel my, my next opportunity, and, and, and that's what I did. Of course, everything was with struggles, with challenges, quite a lot of it. I remember at one time, when I did my L-level, and, and I passed my exam, many of my classmates and friends out there, and even community leaders told me, why do you want to go from five and six, advanced level, when your parents are in such a poverty, why don't you just look for a job, start helping them out? I said, no. You know, if I, I start from this level, then I'm not getting enough. 
I want to get maximum education because the opportunity is available now. And then now from there I can get a better job to help my sisters, my brothers, and the rest of them. So they used to write to me when I was in a level. They used to tell me, please drop out. We are already in college. We are already teaching uh, college, and we are doing very well. In two years' time, we'll be earning. We'll be now moving around without a job. But all those letters, I used to file them. I still have them, because that is one of the things that used to pull me down. I got quite a number of proposals at a different level of my school to get married. Different level, at uh, standard seven. The first person came and he said that he wanted to get married to me, of course, through my parents, and my father accepted. <laughs> he said, yes, it's okay, this is, I think she needs to move out of this house and get married so that at least the rest can also get married. At form six level, when I was just about to finish form six, another person came to propose. The first one, I told my mom now, I can't do this one because I need to get, I, I need to finish my education. And I promised. That if I finish then, this person, if he can wait, I can get married to him. But the guy said, oh, stand seven and then go for another two years. He was not sure. But I pleaded with the guy and I said, I'm ready, I'll be waiting. And then my mother supported me. And I said, you know, it's better to have a mother, a girl who is educated because I'll help him in doing quite a number of things, including health, education, education, and all that kind of stuff. So at form six, when my mother came and I told my mom, now I'm ready. Let me get married. So I got married at, uh, after form six, that was age 19. And the immediately I was married, my result for, I mean, for university came. I was the best girl in the county. And I was supposed to be joining uh, Kenyatta University to do Bachelor of Education Arts but I'm already married. But I said, because the university, I had already done my research, and I knew that you can get married and go to university. That will not stop me from going. So we had agreed with my mom and father, and the guy who wanted to marry me, because I did not know him, I accepted. <laughs> and I said, it's fine, as long as I go to university, that's okay. So he said, okay, you know, because he was an accountant, he's working, he said, I'll be dropping you, after I'll be visiting over the weekend, and you can start a family. I said, that's the best thing you can ever do. <laughs> and we accepted. So I got married at age 19. And uh, just before, when I was just joining university, I was already expected, two months old, I mean, two months pregnant. And I joined the university. I continued study. And in between, after six months, we were supposed to have gone to NYS, National Youth Service, because that time people used to go for NYS. So by the time we were supposed to be going for NYS, I was already six months pregnant, so I missed out a critical um, uh, experience that I'm supposed to have had to join the rest in NYS. But I said, I have, I have, I'm expecting, I have a husband, and also have a child in me, so that will keep me going. But when my friends came back, the other classmates who, were, who went, I mean, the other students who went to NYS came back were at different levels. So that was really affected me. It was quite difficult. And the lady whom I was expecting that time is Madina Abdi, who is just sitting next to me. Please stand up and just wait to be proud. <laughs> this is the most fortunate girl because I think she did not go through the challenges I went. That's, that's fine. So, so, so I, I finished, I mean, I joined university. By the time I was finishing and graduating, I was expecting my son, my second born son. So for, unfortunately, I was not able to join the rest of the other students to go and graduate with the gown, you know, the ceremony, it's nice, the way I've been waiting for all this all my life. So I just gave a day before the graduation, I gave birth to my son. That's <laughs> Again, I missed, another, I missed another great opportunity that I really, I really wanted to see, you know, the sweat of, I mean, the, 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 the fruits of the sweat that I've, I've, I've done. But all the same, at least I was able to finish my university and I was posted back to a school where I started, that's Garbatton High School, to go and teach there. So I taught there for two years. And maybe one thing that I, I want to say, as I'm expected to say things that can empower the women. Of course, getting into teaching and also getting into leadership. Because I was the immediate former women rep for Isolo County, 
I was in parliament, national parliament. I was elected as a, as a, for the slot for the women that came in for, for, for women after 2010 constitution of Kenya. It's quite, quite difficult even to go up on the radar. The challenges and struggles for women. And I know quite a number of you here have had challenges even getting into best things that you don't do in your life. The handle is quite difficult for women. The stake is higher for women. How did I manage to get from primary school, secondary school, A-level, university, and did my master's, and then taught for 15, 16 years, as, as she said, joined quite a number of organizations, uh, and, and finally got into because I was given 20 minutes, I don't want to bore you. How did I manage to do that? You have to be loud enough. <laughs> you have to be loud. You have to be, you have to be visible. Everything that I did in my life, I was never given a massive platter. I've struggled, I've fought, I've been disappointed, I've struggled and all that. How did I do that? Is being loud, being visible, be out there in the community, and every little thing that you do counts. Sometimes, when I was uh, immediately I, I finished and I was teaching at Isolgas for 16 years, I never thought anybody was watching that I was doing a great job. Coming in as a new pre teacher, teaching for one year. And then after one year being a principal of a, the only girls school in the county, just for me to be able to mentor them, encourage them young as I was. It was not easy. People become principals at, after they've taught for 16 years. But I did it after one year. And I was posted to the only girls school in the county just to be able to teach the girls, I mean to encourage the girls. And most of them still thought that I was their age mate. You know when I started there, they think that I'm so I used to be like a small, tough headmistress who used to tell me, the ladies, you have to do one, two, three. It was not easy. Because they were controlling about 300, 400 girls. For 16 years, about 13,000 girls passed through my hand. And the 13,000 girls came from a background that I came from. So even encouraging some are not very you know, good, some want to be cheeky and all that kind of stuff, and pulling them and ensuring that they've, they've succeeded. And mentally, it was not quite easy. So being loud enough, ensuring that you do small things that will be noticed by people around you, who do you think that they're not noticing? That is one, is ensuring that at least you are out there working with the community. Every time there was a, a rape case, every time there was uh, early marriage issue, every time there was something to do with the FGM, I'm the first one to be called by the community. Why? Because I'll be able to talk to the police, I'll be able to mobilize women, and, and, and you know the activists in part of me, and then ensuring that things happen, and that that girl is protected, the girl is taken back to school, that the person who done that go to jail. And I was not very popular that time, and I thought now, why am I doing all this because people keep on cursing? People are saying, by the way, you went through the FGM yourself. Why are you refusing? And you have to, the first degree, the second degree, you have three beautiful children, yeah? You're already a principal, you're already this, you're already this. Why are you telling us not to do? Let them look like you and then they go through the, the, the rite of passage. Of course, it was quite difficult. Every time I went to talk to the women about stopping FGM, they used to say, Tia should not tell us. Look at the way she is, she's beautiful. Look at this, she has degrees. Why are you telling us not to be like you? But I said that was bad part of it that I did not tell you and I want to tell you now. They said, okay, what was the problem? Why, why you, why you, did you go through Cecilia section? I said, no. Did you have normal birth? Yes. Did you ever have any complication? I said, no. Then, why you refused? So, of course, that was a tradition that we had to sit with the mothers, we had to sit with the children in school. Of course, in high school, for those 16 years, I was also a mentor. Every time we, I was in assembly, I used to tell them about all these things. So, so basically, do small things that will help. Tell the community that you, you, are, you are outstanding because you are able to know your the, 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 the law of the land. You are able to teach them. You are able to go to the you are able to go to the community radio and talk to them in your vernacular language. You are able to do everything else that others cannot do. 
you have you have the personality, you have the of course people respect you because you are the principal. So I, I, I use that one also to help. Um, the other thing that I also did and I think that gave me an edge in terms of even competing with the rest of the other com um, ladies or the other community members was my level of education. So put effort, learn, get papers, get papers, ensure that at least you are able to, 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 to compete with the rest of the things. So most of the time when I go there, out there, issue of uh, experience, issue of uh, academic qualification, issue of community knowledge and all that was another thing. So I think that those are some of the few tips I would give you on empowering yourself. Throw yourself out because sometimes when you don't ask, nobody will ever give you. So if an opportunity arises, make sure that you've applied for jobs. You have taken yourself and you've explained yourself and say that I'm able to do one, two, three, I have this experience and, and things work. By the moment you sit back, nobody will ever give you. You must be on top of the roof, talking about the things that you're passionate about. If you don't talk about it, nobody will ever know. Because if you think that somebody else will talk about it, will not. Uh, so I think through that kind of experience and also community knowledge, I think I've been able to also help women to do that. I've mentored quite a number of them. Thank you, Shifani. Thank you, and I hope, uh, I wish you the best in this conference.